Welcome to session 20, part one of Mathematical Methods for Signal Processing. And what I have prepared as an entry is a little GeoGebra uh, experiment, which probably took three minutes to type in. And so what you can see here is an animated version of Gauss functions. And because we will discuss a lot about certain operators, including translation, modulation, and stretching in the two different manners. So what you see here uh, is a green curve, which is the Gauss function, simply e to the minus pi x squared, which is normalized in L1 and L infinity, because it's Fourier invariant, you can see the peak is at one. I was wrong probably when I was mentioning that the L2 norm is also equal to one. It's of course, the L2 norm requires to take the square of a Gauss function, which is smaller. So you have to normalize it properly to get a normalized window in, in for this purpose. Now the blue version is just applying the D row operator. And uh, if I uh, ignore the, the uh, display of the pure frequency, you can see what happens if you take a row large and larger, so it's uh, more compressed, it's the value preserving the stretching or so. Now, of course, I can also animate the ST row operator, which we know is the, now we concentrate on the red curve, it's the area preserving operator. And ju so just by looking at, at the, these functions, you can ask, well, what happens if you let uh, rho go to zero? So the red curve is concentrating. Now it's big, it's very flat. But once it, uh, the parameter I used co to call it r is getting smaller and smaller, the red curve is more and more concentrated. So at the end, you would say it's concentrated at zero. That's almost, you cannot plot it anymore, of course. Uh, and that's when it goes to the Dirac delta. The delta distribution is a measure, is a bounded measure. Therefore, it's a mild distribution in the sense of my terminology. And this is the typical form of weak star convergence. So if you apply it to a test function, and for us, the test function space is the zero space or the amalgam space local FL1 global L1, then you will observe it's acting like the Dirac. So integrate a red curve, which is extremely narrow against any test function, you will pick out the value at zero and that's by definition uh, called the linear functional delta at zero. Now, if you watch what happens if rho is going to infinity, it's getting more and more flat. And then you would say, well, if you integrate it against the test function and we can argue that you can test it against the test function with compact support, then at the end, the action is almost zero. Well, this corresponds we know that the red curves, I mean, they're not synchronized, but the red curves um, are going to the um, blue curve. So maybe I'll stop the animation. Uh, uh, okay. Um, and let me take some relatively small value, not, not too small of, of, of the compression operator and some corresponding small value of the uh, of the uh, no, corresponding value. Oh no, that's right, yeah. So here you can see that uh, the red curves got, tend to go to the Dirac Delta. So they are getting more and more concentrated. And of course the Fourier transform of the Dirac Delta is constant one and the blue curve is going also to the, uh, to the constant one, the Fourier transform of the Delta, but it's not in the naive sense. It's just uniformly over compact set. If you pick up, the support of a test function with compact support, you observe it's going to one. You don't care that it is negative values even far away from the center. Okay, on the other hand, now if I take a compression parameter like this, it's a very flat, still area one, uh, but then you, what you get here is, uh, sorry, that would be the same. Yeah, okay, so this curve. So now this, flat red curve would correspond to a more and more narrow blue curve. So what is the limit at the end? Well, you integrate any function, 
against a function or a test function which is bounded against a function which is small and small integral. The support shrinks, the amplitude is not changed, so it goes to zero. And that's exactly what you can say in the weak star sense. Uh, if you go in the opposite direction, everything is shrinking. Now, if I take the pure frequencies, uh, I can, of course, uh, multiply the pure frequency with the Gauss function. Maybe, uh, no, I didn't do it, uh, but I can, uh, seem to be a problem here, getting to the input window, yeah, here. Uh, now, if I take the Gauss function translated, uh, and T is a translation parameter, I just say Gau translated at X is uh, G of X minus T. So that's the harmless definition. Now, if you are, uh, I make the parameter T visible now, if you shift it, you see how it moves from left to right. Now we have uh, the brown curve. And uh, as you see, there is nothing view, nothing visible anymore uh, once I make the T too big. So an observer who is only seeing the window, let's say the time window from minus three to plus three, he would say, okay, it's gone, it's going to zero. So shifting a Gauss function or any bump function uh, to infinity also is weak star kernel limit. Now I don't want to do uh, the last thing, which was to modulate it. Then of course, translation goes to modulation, weak star convergence goes to weak star convergence, so everything is fine. And so the only thing I would like to show you once more is uh, these windows, uh, yeah, which are uh, obtained by multiplying the blue window. Yeah, okay, now this, this should be done. I try to remove some other things here. Okay, now, now here I have the pure frequency, maybe I eliminated here, and I'm, I multiplied with a blue window, and now you can change the, the frequency and you, uh, that was changing the width of the function and changing the frequency. So here you have maybe a high frequency, very flat already window. And you remember that these functions were uh, crucial for the definition of or the, for the proof of the Fourier inversion theorem. We were using the fact that this guy here, this very flat Gaussian multiplied with the frequency is of course a very concentrated red guy at the frequency, at the position which is corresponding to the frequency. So if you want to pick up f of t, you say, well, I have to integrate against a Gauss type or Dirac impulse of Gaussian shape, so to say, at the point. Uh, and this is on the Fourier transform side, exactly this uh, blue guy with the blue envelope. And uh, by the fundamental relationship for the Fourier transform, you can translate one to the other, which gives you the inverse Fourier transform. Now you can also argue that, and that's another issue that we have to address from time to time, that we cannot be sure that if you have a function in L1, that the Fourier transform is in L1. And that's why all these summability tricks have to come in. Given the Fourier transform, you cannot just take the inverse Fourier transform, that would be nice. But if it's too, going down too slowly, like a sync function or so, then you would multiply the Fourier transform with such a blue guy. You make it in a way that you guarantee integrability, even with a very huge integral, but gain integrability by multiplying with any function in a zero, here it's the Gauss function. And then you can play back and forth because you're inside uh, L1, FL1. So uh, you are inside the domain where you can jump from one side to the other. And that's a trick that is coming up all the time that we have different layers of generality and that we try to take limits from the small set where we can understand things quite well uh, to the general situation. And always I repeat to say, it's like rationals, real and complex numbers. How do you compute one over square root of two? 
Well, you approximate it by rationals, you invert these approximations and you verify or you know a priori that they have limits. And so the same thing happens in our case. Now, um, we have essentially two things on our program at the moment. I would like to connect um, the classical theory with the new approach. And of course, to continue with the new approach, you're talking also a little more about Gabra expansion and short time Fourier transforms. So uh, at the moment, things are not completely uh, aligned in the, in the script. Uh, that's why I would like to still show you a few things beforehand. If you go to the standard script, uh, you should look from time to time uh, to the table that you have here. This is exactly what I was showing you in GeoGebra, uh, but now with a symbolic description. The important thing that you might want to recall is that if you take uh, the ST row operator, then it's area preserving or mass preserving. We even have extended to the bounded measures, but also support preserving. So if you apply ST row to a function, which is supported on an interval, then the uh, stretched version is on the row times the same interval. So if you compress it, the interval is getting smaller and smaller. So the limit of those intersected bump functions, if they have compact support, would be exactly the point one. But we have to discuss the concept of a support of a function also. Uh, okay. Uh, and this is one thing. The other thing is, something that I have uh, typed uh, just now for, for explanation. So something that I was trying to illustrate you uh, in the GeoGebra experiment is if you're taking weak star limits and they're kind of a different nature. Here you have the compressed Gauss function where you're uh, doing getting the Dirac Delta. So it's you're leaving this space of functions, you are reaching an element, which is however a very natural, simple element. If you shift to infinity in any speed or so, you will get zero. If you uh, compress, now if you stretch, that's the Fourier transform version of the first one. If you stretch the Gauss function, you get constant one. Now you can say constant one is a bounded function and delta zero is a distribution, but in our world of mild distributions, and of course, the same would be in tempered distributions. They're just a Fourier transform pair. Now, if you modulate a function, then it's just a Fourier transform version of a translate, so it must go to zero. But it's also clear if you integrate a function, a test function against a modulated version of this, it means that you take the product function, so that would be test function k against uh, g, more and more modulated and then integrated. Well, you look at the Fourier transform at position n of the product function. But the Fourier transform of a product of two test functions is a test function. So it's just riemann lebesgue lemma that tells you that this has to go to zero. So either you're saying, we know already that this concept of weak star convergence is invariant under the Fourier transform, or you are uh, just proving it by riemann lebesgue the last thing was the red curve, which I had before, getting more and more flat spread out. So as a distribution, it seems to go to zero. Nevertheless, it's not completely useless and I will uh, make use of it. Maybe also it's in terms of content, it's not maybe the ideal place, but uh, because I have prepared this in the same slide, uh, on the, which we will be integrated into the extra script. Let me uh, just recall or introduce the notion of the support of a distribution. We will discuss it in more detail later on, but we all know that the Dirac Delta is zero everywhere except at zero and at zero it has the value plus infinity is the story that is so often told and so wrong. But it's not wrong in the sense that Yes, the Dirac is zero outside of the origin. Now in distribution theory, and we apply the same principle, 
you can define the support of a function in a good way. And this also has to be consistent with the classical definition of a support. So recall, if you have an ordinary continuous function, either with compact support or general, then the support is the closure of the set of relevant points. And points are relevant if the point the function is non-zero at these points. So here you have exercise. This is the definition and is it uh, kind of, you may ask yourself, why did you, why does one take the closure? And I think the main reason is we want to have a consistent concept of support, which is applicable to ordinary function in the same way as to uh, distributions. So uh, we identify, as we know, as you know, a ordinary function K, let's say even in a zero or even a bounded continuous function with a mild distribution, sigma H of F is integrate F against H. And because a zero is inside of integrable functions, uh, those integrals are well defined, define a distribution in a zero prime. So this is the goal, but how do you do it? And um, I did a verdict description here, which is definition one. So I would say, well, what is the opposite of the relevant set? It's the area of irrelevance, the area where the test, the distribution, this linear functional is acting in a trivial way. Now, if you ask me, what is the difference between a distribution? I mean, I'm using a slightly different wording for this as other colleagues. So for me, a distribution is a linear functional on the space of test functions like a zero or so, where some people insist that it should be called a generalized function, whereas distribution is reserved to this test function spaces with infinitely differentiable test functions. I'm not sharing this viewpoint, but I wanted to mention it here. So you're saying one is, where is an area where it is acting trivially? And that's the big difference between abstract dual spaces and uh, generalized functions or distributions. Abstract dual spaces don't have a support, you don't have test functions and so on. And therefore you cannot test uh, on local locally supported test functions. But we have arbitrary small compressed triangular functions, for example, in our domain. And so you can say, well, if you have uh, the situation that a certain point, you can make a, a ball around the certain point X in, in RD of, rate of some positive radius, and you observe or you can guarantee that for any function F in our test space, which is living inside that little ball in that area, they always get zero then whatever happens in nearby, near, near the point of interest X will be ignored. So there will be no action. So you can modify your function in such a, you can take a partition of unity, leave out all the parts which are uh, inside of uh, this ball and you would not have any effect. So there, it's completely irrelevant for the action of the distribution. Okay, so this is more or less the good for possible formal definition. And I said, I put as an exercise to verify that this would be consistent with the support concept for classical functions. Now, the first observation is that this definition guarantees that you get an open set. Open simply means that if you have a point which is a point of irrelevance, which actually means there's a little circle of irrelevance, then of course, nearby points are also okay. So just take any uh, element y in the, in, the, in the area around x with radius eta over two. So it's the inside of our ball. And then you can make another ball around the center y and that it's completely contained in the ball of radius eta around the original point x. So yes, the eta has to be replaced by eta one half. And if your point is closer to the original eta, then you have to make smaller points, but actually all the points of our open ball B eta around X are also points of irrelevance. And so for every point, there's an open neighborhood, which is also in the same set of irrelevance, and therefore it's an open set. 
which of course then means, and uh, I'm just uh, mentioning it now, that the support of the distribution, that's the set of, irre of relevance, so to say, is the uh, complement, it's, it's RD minus an open set, which is a closed set. So we are defining it in this way. Now, um, I don't want to go too deep, but um, to give you an idea, the support of a Dirac uh, delta of a point measure is of course just a single point set X. Uh, it will be interesting, and that's why I don't talk too much about this at the moment, to have the converse. If you have a mild distribution where the support is a single point, then it must be up to a scalar factor a Dirac delta. And that's quite different from, from the from the situation of tempered distributions, where you could have, it could be a derivative of a delta of any order, a partial differential operator or so. Maybe it's also good to talk about, mention uh, our example of cubic polynomials. We were using cubic polynomials. Oh, something wrong. We are talking about cubic polynomials um, and uh, these cubic polynomials are a nice Banach space, four-dimensional space, and derivatives, second-order derivatives at any point are such functionals. But cubic polynomials clearly don't allow you to define the concept of a supportive functional, so because they're living everywhere. Okay, now what is the support of a Dirac comp concentrated over lattice? Is of course exactly this um, lattice. If you have a weighted zero comb, you can put them anywhere uh, and at all the places where you have a Dirac with non-zero coefficient, everything is fine. Okay. I will answer the... Yeah, okay. Uh, there was a question in the chat about the kind of value of uh, the Dirac at infinity. I will talk uh, at, at zero, uh, but uh, I, have, I will talk about this. I have already put in the script a note about uh, an example of Kanval, which says that it could be minus infinity, but uh, this is a very delicate point of discussion which takes longer. So I just answered this question in the chat, but I will not I'll go into details now. Okay, so uh, what if you have um, a trigonometric polynomial? So kind of to show you what we can do with such a thing. Well, a trigonometric polynomial is a linear combination of pure frequencies. So you could give me cosine of, I don't know, 20 pi x. So you would say frequency is 2 pi times 10. So it's frequency 10. And cosine by Euler's rule is plus minus exponential function. So you will see a delta sitting at minus 10, another delta at plus 10 with the amplitude of your cosine divided by two. So any linear combination of sine and cosine function, that's exactly equivalent, or any finite linear combinations of pure frequencies would have a, a, a representation in, in this form. And we will define in a, later on the spectrum of a, of a distribution, of a mild distribution as just the support of the Fourier transform. So what is the Fourier transform of a linear combination of pure frequencies? It's exactly the same linear combination, CK of delta SK. Therefore, the support is exactly the set of all those frequencies which occur of course, I assume that this is a canonical representation where you're not saying I'm taking a frequency and then I take it away and actually have zero frequency at that position. And so it's the, the natural way of thinking of things. Now, I would like to mention because it's not something that I'm not, I will not do in, in detail is uh, almost periodic functions can be understood in the same way. You're just, you can define the space of the classical space of Bohr was the guy doing this, of almost periodic function as the closure of these trigonometric polynomials in our space 
of bounded continuous function with respect to the supernorm. So you just take all the, those specific functions which can be approximated uniformly by such expressions. And then uh, you can try to do full analysis and that's actually working quite well. And the idea is quite relatively simple. You can understand it already um, in our setting by looking at a special case. You can have more complicated objects, but the easiest case is an almost periodic function could be an absolutely convergent sum of pure frequencies. They don't have to be aligned harmonically as one says. So they don't have to have a common lattice. You can take, I don't know, cosine of square root of two times x and anything that comes to your mind. You take coefficients which are absolutely convergent, so in little l1, and therefore this sequence is absolutely convergent and therefore convergent in CB, it's a Banach space as we know from the beginning. Now guess what is the free transform of this in the sense of tempered distribution It's just a sum of Dirac's. So think that somebody is giving you a collection of isolated things, so I would use a stem command in MATLAB to demonstrate something here. How could you pick out one of them and isolate the coefficient? And of course, you would just multiply this guy on the free transform side with triangular function. And if you want to pick out the fifth guy, so a delta of S, at S number five, you would try to concentrate your blue triangle with a, free, with a shift uh, at the position and multiply it so that at the end you get CK times, or C5 times delta S5. And so the procedure of defining the free transform of an almost periodic function is more or less exactly the same thing where we go back to the free transform and you remember a shift on the frequency side is a modulation on the time side, a compression on this, this was the blue triangle put very narrow, or not triangle, let's say the blue Gauss function compressed, but in a value preserving way, you would like to multiply your delta with one, but you would like to kill all the other neighbors, so to say, or eliminate them by filtering them. Okay, and that means that you have to take a very long red window on the time side. These are exactly these averages. So you would say it's, um, an average uh, over a big long part of this almost periodic function. And if you take a long enough part, then you will find out that it's exactly picking out your free coefficients. And then it's not necessary anymore that they are in, in a, on the lattice or so. Okay, so this was a little bit a sidestep in the sense uh, that uh, I prepared this material. I wanted to go back with the dilation parameter and hopefully, yeah. Uh, we have things spread out a little bit still, but uh, I wanted to recall to you that um, we have the ST row and the D row operators acting on a zero. And uh, now the, the statement is the following. For any dilation, being it a ST row operator or a D row operator, we can have a control on these operators. All of them are bounded. And this is a consequence of the atomic representation. If somebody maybe, first of all, if you know what happens with ST row, you can translate it into D row more or less because it's just the opposite, one over row and the rescaling. So if it's just plain invariance of the space, you can concentrate on one or the other. Now the ST row operator is maybe easier to understand because it does not change the, the uh, size of the support or maybe, maybe the D row operator. We know that ST row is L1 preserving. For the atomic representation, we are in the Fourier algebra. So the ST row isometric invariance gives you the D row isometric invariance of, of this function. So if you have your, let's say your Gauss function and you compare an atom living in some box and you compress it with the, some big row, so row is larger than one, then you will have an atom which is in the same space, it's in the Fourier algebra, 
its support is at a different place. Of course, it's at the position x over rho if the original center was x, but it's smaller even. And that gives, maybe that's the first point, the d rho operators, so these are the compressing operators, uh, they are uniformly bounded on this zero. Now, on the other hand, you can think of the st rho operator. These are the ones which make out of the red curve, the flat curve, which is where you compensate the size of the support by the, by the uh, blocks here. I mean, I only said that blocks are replaced by blocks of size one over, uh, of, rho time, of rho times the original block size. We have this atomic characterization for arbitrary radius. So for every radius, every so for every row and every radius, you get the new radius, which by equivalence gives you some constant. So that's not controlling how the operators grow. However, you can imagine that if you have uh, this situation that you stretch, maybe your support is going up by a factor of ten. So everything which was living into five blocks is living on fifty blocks. But also the amplitude in this case is damped by one over 50, uh, uh, by, um, by my one over 10, by the st stretching factor. So that's why these st rho operators, which makes functions flat, but making amplitude small are uniformly bounded. So I wanted to just stress these two properties. And uh, the second statement is the complementary, just saying for the opposite direction, we have invariance, and I didn't care for the growth of these operators. Now I hope that I can find my, no, that's not good. Trying to see the problem. Yeah. Uh, I have to see that uh, I've I put my, some information into the notes about stretching. No. Yeah, okay. So then maybe, uh, uh, so, so what I will come back later. So we have now the ingredients that we are living in the world of mild distributions that uh, aside from the very relatively strong norm of a convergence term of norm convergence in the zero prime, we have weak star convergence. And so um, at another time, I will explain to you how you can uh, do very, uh, quite a few uh, uh, abstract heuristic uh, transitions that you find in the books, like going from Fourier series to Fourier transforms in the from, from the periodic case to the non-periodic case and other transitions, uh, how you can explain them in a, in a good way. So maybe, uh, I show you next, uh, and as the, to finish the first part, uh, something which I only wanted to describe to you, not, not that I think it's necessary to do all the details, it's more that you know that such details can be done and that the classical theory of, uh, of discrete convolution and periodic cyclic convolution are also can be understood in the context of mild distributions. So essentially what I try to do is what has ordinary convolution as we have understood them now, and it's a convolution between measures and test functions in C0. It's a convolution between mild distributions and test functions from a zero prime. It's L1 with L1 and all these things, how this can be related to the uh, concept of cyclic convolution. And is it really different or is it? Okay, and uh, in the proofs, you will see that uh, the use of Dirac comps and the allowance to apply free transform to them is one of the key properties. 
So over and over again, we will see Poisson's formula or the transition of a Dirac comp to the Dirac comp on the orthogonal lattice um, is what we need. And so sometimes I will explain it in a concrete version. Sometimes I will do it in an abstract general version. And later on, we can take looks at these things in MATLAB environments, for example, 2D discrete periodic, if you want. Okay, so what is the situation in, uh, in, with periodic signals? Now, assume you're giving me a lattice in RD, so that can be a real integer lattice, a distorted integer lattice, or in the case of a one-dimensional signal, you're just saying, well, you give me some number alpha or A, A times integers is the only possible subgroup for some positive A. And then uh, we can say, well, let, now let's look at the action of a bounded input, bounded output system, uh, BBOS, on, a lambda, on the lambda periodic elements. So I'm using a new symbol. I'm writing C sub lambda for C for continuous complex valued functions, which are lambda periodic. I was playing around and decided to leave out the B because any periodic function if it's continuous, it will be automatically bounded. So it's a little bit redundant to say bounded continuous. I could have said, take all the functions which are uh, continuous, but periodic with respect to a true lattice. So something like this, or it's, you don't see the shift. Okay, so that's a side remark why they are bounded and actually inside of C UB of our space of uniformly continuous functions. Now, uh, it's quite clear that uh, if you're uh, not clear, but uh, true, if you take a regular BUPU, and here I'm taking a function which is obtained by shifts along lambda, and maybe I should mention that, of course, you can give me any lattice uh, uh, which is matrix, non singular matrix applied to the standard lattice, and I can fabricate such a thing and very easily. Um, I can have even smooth functions because if you give me this, I can make a fundamental domain for the lattice. Uh, so that's like the unit cube, which covers the, the plane. Uh, and uh, then you're smoothing this indicator function. So it's psi lambda are shifted versions. They add up to one and, and it's continuous and compactly supported. And then the claim is, well, a function is a periodic function in the space of bounded functions if and only if it's a periodized version of a, a localized version of your function f. So in fact, there is a slightly extra additional one. Here I'm talking about compactly supported, but even if you would give me a function in the Wiener algebra, so it's not really compactly supported, but it's an absolutely convergent sum of these pieces. So it's a well decaying function. Let's say the, the Gauss function. Uh, it's clearly not compactly supported, but you can periodize it, of course, and there's no problem. And then the periodized function is, of course, a lambda periodic function. So the statement is you can periodize functions if they are decent, if they are absolutely Riemann integrable, more or less. And everything is well defined. You control the subnorm uh, of the resulting function convolution product in a natural way. On the other hand, if you're asking, can I obtain it? You can even choose a particular localized version from this. Now, uh, this is more or less an exercise. I think I have a proof later on. Now you can look at the action of a BBOS system uh, or a BBOS bounded input of the operator on such a thing. So we know from the very beginning that T is a convolution by a bounded measure. And uh, uh, the question is now, do we have uniqueness? And the statement is no. You can have many, many different measures always having the same action on this, on this narrow subspace C lambda. For example, if I do a finite or even infinite linear combination of shifted versions, you would get the same thing as long you have a, a, comp, a linear combination. So maybe you take three elements, 
put amplitude 103 for each of them and you cannot see the difference. And the proof is really that just this last one line or so. I'm reading to you the, the argument. You're giving me such a linear combination of emphasis lambda shifts of the original measure. And then you know that convolution and uh, uh, convolution commutes with translation. So I have translates of the mu, but of course I can also have a translates on the fk, uh, on the f, but t lambda k, even if they're different elements from our lattice, it's a subgroup, it's just the same as f. So you get a linear combination with coefficient ck of mu times f, and that of course, because they're adding up to one is mu with f. So there are a lot of different things that you can do. Now, in order uh, to reduce the action uh, of uh, kind of using the ambiguity, we can do the following thing. We can use our poo poo, we decompose our measure into pieces. We know that we can do it for any poo poo, but of course now we are doing it in a way adapted to the lattice lambda. So we, we know from the early part of the course that the sum of the pieces is exactly the norm of this here. And that means, well, we can rewrite um, the action of the measure. So a general paper system can be uh, replaced by the action of some measure new, which has compact support Q. So there, uh, the claim is instead of arbitrary measures, we can assume that they're all concentrated on a set Q. Now we're kind of doing the reverse of what we have been doing before. Instead of saying, well, we can add pieces which are spread out, we can collect them and put them all to, towards the center. So uh, how will we will do it? Well, we will take the pieces mu psi lambda, which are concentrated at the lattice points, and we shift them back to the origin. So then all of them are concentrated near the origin. Okay, so the first thing is, we know that mu is the same, so it's almost the same story in the opposite direction. Mu is mu with f. Mu is the sum of the pieces. Everything is absolutely convergent, so no problem. We can shift these pieces and it will not change. I mean, I was writing it by saying, well, we shift the, the mu to the left and uh, at the same time, the f to the right. That's of course, in the convolution product of having no effect but the right convolution is, it can be ignored. So it's a one possible argument here. But this is now the measure new by definition, which is well-defined and controlled. And the norm of the measure new is uh, at most the norm of the measure mu because it's the sum of the parts. Shifting doesn't change the norm of a measure. But obviously when we shift everything back, it's like we take the measure Itself, move it back to the original location and cut it with the psi. So this accumulation is just take all these shifted per, uh, versions, cut them always with the same psi. So what can you say about all these localized measures? They all have a support and that's now the support in the sense of measures. But if you have a product of a function with a measure, it's clear that uh, it will be inside the support of the function. We have used such an RD idea uh, explicitly already when we did these convolution results um, for the pieces, but for amalgam spaces, but okay. So we just have to take Q to be the support of the pupu. And that's of course inside any compact set is inside some ball of some radius. So we can replace the action of this. Now, the next question would be, how small can we do it? And in order to have a partition of unity, you may think, well, we take the fundamental domain and that has to be smoothed out or so. So somehow you expect that you can go to the extreme case and I'm doing it now only for, uh, for the one dimensional case, no, for, uh, for the d dimensional case, but now I'm going for the, the kind of doing it with Lebesgue integration, because I mean, I connect with the classical situation anyway. So uh, 
In the one-dimensional case, I would choose a fundamental domain if it's symmetric to be the symmetric interval minus one half to plus one half. I think it's in order to have compactness, I prefer to take the closed interval. Of course, the shifted copies of these sets are overlapping at the, at the half if integers, but this is a set of measure zero. So in the, in the discussion of L1 function, this doesn't play a role. You could also take a unit cube, which is zero one to the power D. Now the claim is, and I'm doing it now the L1 case, if you give me a Bebel system which has an absolutely continuous measure, so an L1 function, that's now classical Lebesgue stuff, then it can be represented by the convolution by a function which is living on such a fundamental domain or on a unit cube, maybe on the d-dimensional version of the symmetric unit cube. And how can you do it? Well, you're using these two tricks that I explained above by saying I periodize my function G because periodizing moves things around and then I localize it. This is exactly the same thing as taking the, the sh integer shifts of G and cutting them with the indicator function. So it's exactly our construction of the measure nu, but now written in terms of functions. Now this G is a function which lives on the unit cube it's integrable there, and you can estimate L1 norm by the L1 of G. That's what we had before. The norm of nu is at most the norm of mu. And the action of this convolution operator, now this is for this discussion here, not a function only defined on the cube, it's a restriction, it's zero outside. So it's one L1 function, this is another L1 functions, but they define the same linear system when you're restricting your attention completely to the space of lambda periodic things. So I think uh, I can skip this part. It's just a repetition of, here, of the earlier part um, because here you see this is more or less the norm of the new function new, which is con more concentrated or so and the sum of the pieces. So before we had mu psi, mu, mu shifted to minus lambda or so. You're accumulating this, and uh, this is really an estimate. So it could be that this is strictly less than one because there is. Now, uh, I'm already over time, but I think it's better to finish this part and then take the break a little bit later today. So the question that comes up is, do we have uniqueness or so? So uh, if we have two such functions um, living on the interval, uh, can we say anything about uh, in which sense do they have to be similar or so? Now, uh, here I'm playing around again with the uh, Dirac combs and their Fourier transforms or so. So if F, is a periodic function, we apply it only to periodic function, we can say it's a periodized version of some function. And in our case now, we can even restrict it to the fundamental domain. So that's very close to the classical setting that people say, no, a periodic function is not a function which is periodic on the real line, but it's just a function on the interval. Okay, so now uh, we're saying that G1, is acting by convolution on such a guy in the same way as G2. But we know that convolution is associative in our setting, and uh, therefore we are not, not allowing any pathological convolutions. Therefore, you can say this here. But this means that, that uh, this is true for every F which has a small support. And one can discuss then then this means that the periodic extension of G1 has to be equal to the periodic extension of this here. So this is uh, uh, one way to do it. I will show you in a moment one more other characterization. But now the question of how does cyclic convolution come into game? And it's the following situation that you're saying, well, you're giving me two convolution operators, two L1 functions, both of them defining Bebel system, you let them act for a fixed lambda on the lambda periodic bounded continuous functions. 
And then you're getting, of course, the convolution product of these measures or the functions pointwise as we know in, in the ordinary way. But even if each of them is supported on the set Q, their convolution product is supported on Q plus Q. So it's, if you take a symmetric interval minus one half to one half, it's concentrated now minus one to plus one. So how could you define the representative in this canonical way? And you just say, well, periodize uh, the convolution product of these local restrictions of G1, G2, and then you, you uh, cut it out at Q1. And if you take this definition, which is in our setting, the natural one, so every, once you fix the lambda uh, and you fix a fundamental domain, you can say that all the L1 functions or even the bounded measures on this domain are representing these functions, then you are getting um, a, an equivalent description of cyclic convolution. And you see here, it's a little bit tricky to understand it in this way, but it really means that you're computing, if you take lambda to be integers, for example, you're computing modulo set. And uh, I will give you more explanations in this direction in the second part of this uh, meeting number 20. So for now, I will stop 